So good morning, and I want to thank you for joining us on this Friday morning. Today we have a number of updates for you on some new travel recommendations, online advancements in telehealth, boosted support for our frontline healthcare workers, and a tax deadline update. Obviously, we appreciate there's a lot of information that's being introduced here on a daily basis. But our goal is to do what we can to keep the public as well informed as we can on the progress that we're making and the adjustments we're pursuing to push back against the virus. We've asked you to take our guidance on staying at home to help our medical professionals flatten the curve, to ramp up testing, and to mitigate the wave that could crash at some point on our healthcare system. Please know that we're working around the clock and we're all in this together. The health and safety of Massachusetts is our top priority and we'll continue to take whatever steps we need to to make that happen. I'm sure everyone's seen the news from New York and other areas of the country that are experiencing severe community spread. The White House Coronavirus Task Force recently advised anyone leaving the New York area or who has traveled through New York City to immediately self-isolate for 14 days. Here in Massachusetts, we're doing everything we can to keep people at home and prevent the spread. And starting today, all travelers arriving to the Commonwealth are instructed to self-quarantine for 14 days. To help deliver this message, travelers entering Massachusetts will be given information flyers instru instructing them of the 14-day quarantine at our major transportation hubs, including Logan Airport, South Station, and Worcester Airport. Drivers will also see these flyers and rest stops on the turnpike and on roadside message boards that will display the message instructing travelers to quarantine. We're taking extraordinary steps here to keep our residents safe, including asking folks to stay home and closing non-essential businesses, every which decision comes with a certain amount of pain, frustration, and disruption for the people of the Commonwealth. At the same time we're asking so much of our residents, we should also be thinking about the potential impact of travelers visiting Massachusetts from other places. We, as I said, we're instructing all visitors arriving in Massachusetts to comply with this request for the sake of protecting the most vulnerable among us all, our parents, grandparents, and those with underlying health conditions. Further, we're asking that folks considering travel to Massachusetts for whatever reason do not travel to our communities, especially if you have symptoms. Healthcare workers, public health workers, public safety workers, and transportation workers are obviously exempt from this requirement. I know I mentioned the New York City area earlier when discussing the need for travelers to self-quarantine, but I want to make clear Governors Cuomo in New York, Murphy in New Jersey, and Lamont in Connecticut are also doing everything they can to slow the spread of the virus. Mayors, public health officials, doctors, nurses, and armies of frontline medical workers everywhere are doing extraordinary work, and they all have said the same thing. Stay home, stop the spread. Before I introduce a rather exciting announcement, I want to take a minute to reiterate the importance of telemedicine as we deal with this outbreak. Our administration has made telehealth available to everyone to help you talk to your doctors and other clinicians and to get medical attention without leaving your house. With a phone call or a video chat, if someone's showing symptoms of COVID-19, they can talk to a provider and not be in close contact with their doctor or the hospital staff. This is extraordinarily important in our fight against COVID-19. Telehealth not only keeps patients safe, but it keeps providers safe too. We ordered telemedicine to be fully covered by health insurance for all services, and I urge everybody to take full advantage of it and not go in person to a medical facility if you have the alternative of a phone call or a video chat. Along these lines, today, we're launching a new partnership to make available an online resource for residents to receive medical guidance from the safety of their home, Bowie Health's online health assistance tool. The online tool is available at buoy.com slash mass to provide medical advice remotely. I want to make clear it is not to be used in place of emergency medical care. Instead, 
It's a tool that's been collecting data and providing guidance to people for many, many months, and everyone can use it to get much more information about their health, which, as we know, everyone is thinking about these days. Bowie Health's tool is free for Massachusetts residents. First, users will be asked a series of questions to complete a risk assessment interview. When a user screens positive for COVID-19 symptoms or risk factors, they'll be directed to the most appropriate resources based on their answers. If a user indicates they're experiencing symptoms or risk factors that are closely associated with those of COVID-19, they'll be directed to other resources. Those resources include a portal linked up with their health insurance provider to talk over the phone or through video chat with a health care provider right away. Again, this is not to be used in the place of emergency medical care. Instead, it's a tool everyone can use to get more information about their health and get connected quickly to the people they need to talk to to get the best guidance and advice about what to do next. We know there's an avalanche of information out there, some of which is great, some of which is good, and some of which is not, neither. And it's our hope that this partnership will answer some of the questions we are all asking ourselves, in some cases, every day. Bowie Health's online health tool offers a 24-7 front door for residents to offer their symptoms and get guidance on next steps. We have with us today Dr. Andrew Lay, who will go into more details on this in just a few minutes. He's the CEO and co-founder of Bowie Health. Our, which, by the way, is also a Massachusetts-based company. Our administration has taken several steps to cut red tape and create avenues for our health care facilities to assign more doctors, nurses, and PAs, physician assistants, to the fight against COVID-19. So far, we've made it simple for our medical professionals to work at different hospitals and in different specialties. We've made it possible to bring more manpower over state lines into Massachusetts and to bring back doctors and nurses in good standing who may have retired. Today, we're working to bring more qualified professionals to the front lines as we fight COVID-19. The Board of Registration of Medicine is giving medical school graduates who match a specific criteria an emergency 90-day limited license to practice medicine to help in the fight against COVID-19. This will be granted for an intern, resident, or fellow at a Massachusetts healthcare facility or training program that's been approved by the board. To qualify for this license, Residents can fill out an application which will be submitted by the program or facility. If approved, the resident will get a license to be able to start supporting our health care institutions. And I want to thank Secretary Sutters and DPH Commissioner Monica Burrell for their work to get this up and running. I think we all know that the COVID-19 outbreak has caused a lot of uncertainty for workers and businesses, especially here in the Commonwealth and across the country. And we anticipate that there will be many taxpayers who struggle to meet their tax filing and payment obligations in light of the economic impact of the virus. Last week, the federal government announced that they were extending the federal tax filing and payment deadline to July 15. Over the past several days, we've worked closely with our colleagues in the legislature to develop a plan to align the state income tax deadline with the federal deadline. In partnership with House Speaker Bob DeLeo and Senate President Karen Spilka, we're filing legislation today to extend the 2019 state individual tax filing and payment deadline from April 15th to July 15th. The income tax relief would be automatic and taxpayers would not need to file any additional forms to qualify. A state extension would provide flexibility to taxpayers and would afford them additional time to file their returns in a way that protects the Commonwealth's strong fiscal footing. This change will provide the Commonwealth's taxpayers with significant relief at this very uncertain time. And I'm very thankful to the efforts of ANF Secretary Mike Heffernan and House and Senate leaders who worked together to come to this agreement, and we look forward to working with the legislature to get this bill enacted. Once again, on behalf of Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito and myself and our entire administration, I want to thank those of you who are staying at home in order to help us stop the spread of the virus. I know there's been a lot of change, a ton of uncertainty, and a lot to adapt to. And these are clearly difficult times, and times in which disruption is becoming more the norm. But the people of Massachusetts 
have overcome trying times in the past, and I'm confident that we will again, together. I urge everyone to subscribe to the Commonwealth's text alert system by texting COVID-MA to 888-777 and continue to get your news from trusted sources like local news, newspapers, and official channels like mass.gov slash COVID-19. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lay and let him talk a little bit about Bowie's technology and capability to assist Massachusetts residents. Thank you so much, Governor Baker. It's an honor to be here with all of you. As a local business here in Boston, our team is eager to help residents in our home state during this crisis. Bowie was founded seven years ago in Harvard's Innovation Lab to help people figure out what to do when they're sick or injured using modern technologies and artificial intelligence. We felt there had to be something better than searching randomly on the internet for help, being scared and alone. That mission has never been more relevant than it is today. Now, we're here to help the Department of Public Health give personalized information and guidance to residents about what to do if they're experiencing symptoms related to the coronavirus, whether that's self-isolation or how to get care and testing. Bowie's self-diagnostic tool uses the latest Department of Public Health and CDC guidelines to help residents understand the risk related to the disease and what to do next. You can find our tool online at bowie.com slash mass. That's B-U-O-Y dot com slash M-A-S-S. -S. Our goal is to empower people to make good decisions about their health during this vital time. Thank you. I was about to say good afternoon, but I guess it's still morning. Um, good morning. First, we would like to acknowledge and send our deepest sympathies to the families and friends that experienced pain and suffering through this crisis. Yesterday, as you know, we reported 10 deaths for a total of 25 loss during this public health pandemic. It's extraordinarily important for us to continue to adhere to social distancing and the basic public health prevention and hygiene measures we have talked about all along. These strategies will have an impact in blunting the spread of the illness. We're not gonna see the impact immediately, but we know that the strategies will have an impact. They can't protect, they can't protect us from difficult days like yesterday, but they will benefit our Commonwealth and the people in the weeks and months ahead. So a couple of additional updates. The COVID-19 public health emergency has put a tremendous demand, as you know, on our healthcare system and access to healthcare workers. In order to respond to this extraordinary demand, a public health order was issued providing advanced practice registered nurses, otherwise known as APRNs, of which we have 13,642 of them in the Commonwealth, in good standing with greater flexibility in their prescribing practices. Specifically, the order allows these certified nurses to continue to prescribe as they've already authorized to do. It authorizes APRNs who have at least two years of supervised practice experience to prescribe without physician oversight. And it authorizes APRNs with fewer than two hours of supervised practice experience to prescribe with physician oversight, but without the normally required written guidelines. These are nurses such as nurse clinical anesthesiologists, midwives, and advanced practice registered nurses. As some of you know, if you stay current with all that we've been doing, we filed a waiver with the federal government last, last Friday, I believe, and recently received approval of some of the things that we've requested. So we applied for a federal waiver to fast track mass health enrollment, streamline administrative requirements for providers, and deliver critically needed healthcare services during the COVID-19 pandemic. CMS, CMS quickly turned around part of our 1135 waiver, and they're still re reviewing some of our other asks. Some of the items approved including enrolling out of state providers and easing other provider requirements when they enroll in mass health. It allows providers to be reimbursed for care in alternative unlicensed settings such as congregate care settings, and if we set up tents and other large programs, and suspends prior authorization requirements 
and extends pre-existing prior authorizations throughout the emergency. Again, the idea is to relieve uh, administrative requirements in order for us to move quickly. And we expect to hear additional approvals um, by the end of today and Monday. Volunteers, as the governor sort of previewed a little bit yesterday, we are asking health professionals who would like to volunteer to help to sign up at our Mass Response website at massmarresponse.org. We're partnering with the Mass Medical Society to match volunteers with our communities and healthcare providers based on volunteers' skill sets and where they're most needed. It just went live, and we already have four individuals since this morning who've signed up. We have an immediate need for respiratory therapists and public health nurses. We'd like to thank the Mass Medical Society for agreeing to be our matchmaker for all of these healthcare professionals. Thank you. So before we take questions, um, Dr. Lay, would you come talk a little bit about how many people have used the system, how much data you guys have collected, and how that factors into the way you improve the quality of the way the system operates? Because I think that would be important for people to hear. Thanks, Governor Baker. Um, so the, we started the company in 2013, and the way we built Bowie was we actually read by hand thousands of clinical papers to teach the program the statistics that underlie medicine. That took us four years, and we launched that product in March of 2017. Since then, we've had about 7.5 million users on Bowie. Um, we see a new person every 13 seconds. And every single time someone uses the program, we learn a little bit more about how each individual is different. In early, uh, I mean, sorry, in early February, we released our, our coronavirus pro uh, protocols, taking states, Department of Public Health, and CDC guidelines, and layered that into our program. Questions about that or other stuff? Right now, it's just going to be people coming through uh, the airport, the two airports, flying in from out of state into the two airports, or coming in on a train to South Station from out of state. Um, and there will be uh, message boards and information available um, in rest areas associated with, um, and on the turnpike, in areas associated with folks coming south, basically up from the New York area. It's well, it's. I would, I would call it at this point instruction and, and advisory. It, there is no enforcement mechanism. Would there be a penalty though? No. No. What about people who live out of state and work in Massachusetts? Who live out of state and work in Massachusetts? Well, first of all, we've obviously shut down a lot of non-essential operations. Um, and we believe that the folks who are working in Massachusetts at this point in time are pretty clear on the guidance that we've set out there for the people who, um, who are part of the Commonwealth. And obviously, again, it's impossible to com ensure that everybody complies with all of this. But if you're working in Massachusetts, that means you're doing something that's essential, and you're getting a ton of guidance and advice that's coming from us and probably from the people you work with and work for about what we expect people to do when they're not at work. So Jonathan? <clears throat> Yeah, they're going to get a, um, a flyer and a note when they show up uh, and get off their plane that encourages them to spend two weeks um, in uh, self-quarantine. Yeah. Well, keep in mind that um, we're already doing um, the work of tracing uh, and tracking people when they uh, are deemed positive. Um, that information goes to the Department of Public Health, goes to the local departments of public health, and then there's a lot of outreach to the person who's been deemed positive with respect to who they've been in contact with and who they've been in touch with. Um, I fully expect, now that we've ramped up our testing activity, uh, that we're going to significantly ramp up our tracing and tracking activity as well. And I might ask Secretary Sarders to speak a little bit to that. No, the traveler piece at this point is, is if, you, if you're coming back from someplace, um, we want you to spend two weeks uh, self-quarantining. Do you want? Why don't you talk a little bit about the stuff we've been doing to set up tracing and tracking? Yeah. The governor's doing a great preview for our next series of announcements. 
Um, so we, uh, uh, as you know, we, uh, anyone who tests positive uh, has to self-isolate, and then we determine who their close contacts are, and then uh, trace those individuals and their contacts, uh, and as to whether they have to, and they have to self-quarantine for 14 days and stay in touch with their local boards of health. Um, we're actually uh, going to be rolling out a much more uh, extensive tracing um, in the beginning of the week, we'll be announcing a far more extensive tracing because if you think about how this is spread, um, it is for every individual who is positive and the contacts around them and then the contacts around them. So what we really want to do is not just the individual who has been um, tested positive and their immediate contacts, but then also looking at the spread of the individuals on the next circle around them. So we are, we're going to be rolling out a much more extensive tracing going forward. Governor, since New York has been such a hot spot, have you considered taking temperatures of people coming in from New York or coming over the border on the flight? You know, um, the answer at this point is uh, we are engaged in discussions with a lot of people about what we can and cannot do, okay? Um, and there are plenty of legal and constitutional issues that are involved in this. We certainly believe um, encouraging people and instructing people who come back to Massachusetts from someplace else um, to self-quarantine for 14 days is a perfectly reasonable and logical thing to expect them to do. Um, and we certainly believe messaging as aggressively as we can. Um, folks who are coming up from the greater New York area is a good idea as well. Um, whether we can do much more beyond that or not is going to be a function of, um, of A, what the public health people tell us they think would be beneficial, and then B, um, what we think is actually sustainable um, from a legal point of view. Boy, I, I follow a lot of the photography that's on social media from people around the Commonwealth, and uh, for the most part, all I see are empty streets and, um, and empty parking lots, and we obviously talk to the folks at the T every day about what's going on with, uh, with their volume, which is pretty much um, cratered almost across the board. And we have, the lieutenant governor is talking to mayors every single day and city managers about what they're seeing in their communities. And, uh, and the message from almost everybody is it's really quiet out there. Governor, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So my recollection on this one, and I'm sure the secretary will correct me if I get it wrong, is that uh, 3,500 tests given the size of Massachusetts would be equivalent to the daily testing regimen that was going on in South Korea, um, given their size and how many tests they were doing on a daily basis at this point in time in the process. I fully expect you'll, I mean, if, if this goes according to plan, you know, I think what the secretary said when we talked about 3,500 out of Quest is that's kind of benchmark number one. There's going to be a benchmark number two and a benchmark number three um, as we go forward here, especially as we roll out uh, a ex more expanded program with respect to tracing and tracking. But what is your still focus? Do you have a goal about how much of the population has to be I think we want to test anybody who's deemed it as, uh, as symptomatic to begin with, based on those criteria that we got from, um, from the CDC, uh, and then to the extent that there are people who've had close contact with those people, we want to test them as well. Governor, the EPA announced last year suspending all Which? EPA. 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 Okay. EPA. Okay. So that, that announcement came out kind of late yesterday, and we've asked our folks 
um, to give us guidance on that. I don't have that guidance yet, but as soon as we do, we'll obviously share it with you. I think the, um, first of all, um, I don't know how to put this politely, so I'm just going to say it. Um, we get told a lot of things about what other states are doing, okay? Just as I'm sure other governors and lieutenant governors and health and human service secretaries get told a lot about what other states are doing too. And then we follow up and find out if that's in fact what they are doing. And sometimes it is and sometimes, um, not quite. Um, so I'm not going to comment on the specific there because I've had several conversations with uh, Governor Raimondo about what they're doing there and, um, and some of what I've heard is different than what she says they're actually doing. So we'll get back to you on that particular question, but, but just understand that there's so much, as I said in my remarks, there's so much information um, out there at this point, even for us as public officials, sometimes when we follow up with our colleagues in other states, the answer we get about what they're actually doing is a little different than the, than the one we've been told, or in some cases even, you know, folks in the, in the media and elsewhere have been told. So gun shops under our order are not considered essential. Um, with respect to um, supply chains, there's a lot of back and forth between the folks at um, Economic Development, which is kind of the keeper of the keys with regard to how the, um, how the essential um, worker and essential business uh, criteria were established. And, uh, and they do give people guidance on whether or not, in fact, somebody does fit with um, the supply chain associated with an essential provider. Sometimes they do, by the way, and sometimes they don't. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, what I can say is that the back and forth that's going on, at least that I've heard, and you've heard, I believe, Lieutenant Governor, from the businesses that we've been talking to, which we are doing literally all the time, uh, is that people feel pretty good about the, uh, the clarity and the, and the quality and the turnaround on the guidance that they're getting from us. But remember, if you're not essential, just remember, if you're not essential and you don't spend any time in your brick and mortar facility um, and you work from home, you still have the ability to operate. And so there are folks who are in non-essential businesses who are not working in the office, who are doing whatever they were doing before in the office online, and they are, quote unquote, still working. <clears throat> I should. I could get this wrong, but I. You won't get it wrong. Go ahead. Wrong. All right. So we re we we report publicly on county basis. Local boards of health know their positive cases. Local boards of health is who first we report. Know addresses too. Right. First responders know addresses, um, but local boards of health because there really are extension, if you would, to do um, the contact tracing. So I would say that local boards of health, which is a part of municipal government, they know their numbers for their towns. So there is, this is where we try to balance um, public health and individual privacy and to avoid people from being bullied. And there have been cases, particularly in the early part of the, before it was a pandemic, of individuals who were 
um, either outed on Facebook or people assumed that someone had tested positive. And so that is the balance that we continue to try to strike. And I know it is not a complete answer for some people, but I will tell you, local boards of health know the individuals who have test positive from their communities. Isn't there a danger, though, that you don't go to town by town that people may have a false uh, impression that, oh, I don't hear anything coming out of my town. My town is okay. Not, not going to be subject to this. I think when you see the numbers and the number of the, the counties that we report every day, um, I think it is fair to say that we have community spread in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, we've started, as you know, we started to put out the age data, which was um, so that people, so that no one can see that, well, this age group is immune. Um, I take the concern of uh, communities thinking that they want to know. But, you know, if you share that kind of uh, health information status about an individual, you also want to ensure that they are also safe and protected from bullying and the like and being spotted by someone. So it is, so what I'm telling you is this is a very constant uh, conversation that we're having. It's one thing in Boston, but if you lived in a community of like several hundred people, um, you know, does that person want to be identified? And what, and what is, and what is the, there, there would be nothing to preclude a local board of health from saying we have 15 positive cases in their, in their community. You know, again, as we continue to sort of roll out um, who's positive, contact tracing and the like, the greater we will know what the impact is on individual uh, communities, counties, employers, and the like. That's my best answer. Thanks, everybody. Can I, can, I, can I just add one other point here? I mean, it's not like we have all the latitude and all the authority over what we can and can't say. The reason that first responders have access to um, addresses in the communities in which they operate that they get from their Board of Health is because the FDA issued guidance, was it two Fridays ago? I think so. It was at some, it was some point fairly recent that the FDA issued guidance that basically said, and the term they used was something like business partners. It wasn't quite business partners, but it was something like business partners could share limited information. And what they were really saying is that local boards of health can tell first responders not who these people are, but they can tell them what their addresses are, because that was viewed as something that would be important for first responders to know with respect to the protection of their own health um, with respect to this stuff. But I think the, um, I think in some respects, um, there are certain things we definitely can do and there are certain things we can't. And some of them have to do with what our authority, uh, where our authority begins and ends, and some of it has to do with where federal authority begins and ends, which gets us back to some of the questions around what you can really do with respect to interstate travel and transportation as well. I think the, um, I mean, if you look at kind of the region that we live in at this point, in the northeastern part of the U.S., uh, I think everybody at this point has a stay-at-home advisory um, in, of some kind in place, or a stay-at-home order, depending upon the state. I mean, I said to you folks before that um, the difference between uh, the words that are actually used in an advisory versus the words that are used in an order are not that much different. Um, but everybody's basically been playing the same song, which is these businesses are essential. And on that one, we're all working, for the most part, off a federal guideline, which represents what I would call kind of the minimum. I mean, if the feds say something's essential, it's essential. You can't take it off, okay? Except with limited exemptions, exceptions. Um, each state, based on the nature of its own economy, um, 
makes modest adjustments to what shows up on that federal essential business list. Um, but on the orders themselves that are being issued, especially with respect to uh, the stay-at-home orders, the messaging, the expectation, um, the, uh, the goal of these orders that are being issued everywhere is basically the same, which is, you know, if you're an essential worker, go to work and go home. If you're um, in a community or a state that has an order like this in place, if you need to go to the doctor, <laughs> check first of all with Bowie, see if you can do what you need to do on a telehealth basis to avoid creating contact between you and the provider community. If that's not going to be the answer and you need to see a doctor, go. You can go to the grocery store. Um, if you have a non-essential business and you can do it online without using bricks and mortar, that's okay too. But the guidance coming from almost everybody um, is pretty similar and in many ways it's based on the framework that we operate under from a, um, from a legal point of view at the state level um, and a, you know, sort of overarching point of view with respect to legally what the feds are saying we can do and we can't do. And, um, and certainly people are going to push the envelope on this stuff in various places. Um, but again, we're all basically playing the same game and singing the same song pretty much um, from Maine to certainly New Jersey and, and probably beyond. Uh, I think the, um, the guidance we're getting from the advisory committee that was set up by the command center and by Secretary Sutters and the advisory, uh, the information we're getting from public health experts and from health care providers here in Massachusetts um, is that, uh, yeah, no, that we're not going to be, we're not going to be up and running by, by Easter, no. Thank and you. It, and it, Thank you. <laughs>